Hello and welcome to 20 Minute Marketing. Thanks for listening and I hope you're having a great day. We're now on episode 34 of the podcast and I'm excited to get started. Today we're going to be speaking with Jen Penaluna from Bigfoot Digital. So hi Jen, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me as well. That's good to hear. Could you spend a minute introducing yourself and Bigfoot Digital for us, please? Yeah, of course. So Bigfoot Digital are a specialist SEO agency. Uh, SEO is at the core of everything we do. So I've been there for just over three years now. Came in as a junior and have sort of worked my way up to, to managing the team now, which I absolutely love doing. So we're going to be speaking about SEO during this episode, which is nice because hopefully it will cover similar themes to the last episode that I recorded with John Vong, which was all about SEO for small businesses. And of course, it's always nice to speak with someone local too. Bigfoot is based in Barnsley, which is just up the road from us in Doncaster. So yeah, let's get started. So I'm going to be honest before we start, this episode is a bit different than normal. Usually when I reach out to people and ask them to be on the show, I'll have a topic or a theme or some sort of loose idea of how the episode's going to go. And I've been connected with Jen for a few months on LinkedIn now and the content that she's been sharing is extremely insightful and engaging. So I figured that I'd ask her to be on the show as a guest, but I wasn't quite sure what topic that she might want to cover. So instead of pitching an idea, I kind of just said, let's talk about something SEO related that you like and that you think will benefit our listeners. And to no surprise, she came back with this really cool idea and an example that we're going to be talking about throughout the entire episode. So Jen's going to be leading the way and I'll sort of chip in with a few questions here and there as we go along. Before we start, though, I believe congratulations are in order. I saw on LinkedIn that you were awarded with a new Jazzy SEO badge for your profile. Yeah, thank you. It took all of like seven minutes to go through the questions. But yeah, it was nice to share it on LinkedIn and sort of show other people that, hey, you can get this as well. It's still pretty cool, though, to have that on your profile, even if it might not be as advanced as other courses or exams. So what are we going to be talking about during this episode then? Yeah, so today I want to talk about search intent, um, especially search intent sort of combined with search volume, because I feel like it's something that can often get overlooked as we're sort of stuck in looking at the data and the figures all the time and forget what people are actually searching for and what, what they mean when they search. Awesome. Before we get started, I just want to make sure that everyone listening does understand the theme. So on a basic level, what is search intent and why is it so important? So the way that I would explain search intent is literally the intent of the search. So when somebody's sat at their phone or their laptop and they're searching for something, what do they actually mean when they search? Are they looking for a piece of information really quickly? Are they looking to buy something? You know, are they looking to go somewhere? There's so many different reasons why people search. And I think it's important to understand what the majority of people doing that particular search actually mean. So there's no point trying to match, you know, here's what I want to rank for. And this gets lots of search when actually that wouldn't be matching what the person wanted because that's the whole point of what Google is trying to evolve to be, to be the best search engine, to return the best result for that specific query. Hopefully that provides an insight to people that are perhaps new to SEO or the marketing industry. If not, then I'm sure you can find lots of great resources online about search intent and why it's important. And I never thought that we'd be talking about razors on this podcast, but I believe that the word razor is going to be the key to this episode. Yeah, so it's a bit of a real world example because we've got a client in this space um, and it's something that we've noticed has changed quite drastically over the last sort of two years. So Razor is going to be the example throughout this. Yeah, sounds very interesting. I assume there are lots of monthly searches using the word Razor. Yeah, so if we plug this into Ahrefs, for example, this is searched for 27,000 times per month. So as headline terms go, it's a pretty big one. So if you were an e-commerce site that's selling razors, you know, you think that that's the golden ticket, you know, 27,000 people, I can get all those coming to my site. Let's sort of look at it not in just, you know, not in terms of just numbers. So let's look beyond search volume. Let's look at what's actually coming up in search results. Liam, what do you think would be the number one result or what type of result do you think would be number one? I'm going to guess that it would be a company like Gillette. They're probably the brand that comes to me first when I think of razors. 
And I think that's a fair assumption. And I think if you, you know, were just looking at it, that sort of spreadsheet kind of level, looking at search volumes, you'd think, right, Razor, that's exactly what we want to uh, rank for because that's what we do. But if we do a manual search and we just plug in the word Razor to Google, we actually get a site called Razor.com. So it's an exact match domain, makes complete sense, but it's actually an electric scooter company for children. So it's not quite what we had in mind, you know, being an e-commerce Razor company. Yeah, that would definitely have been my last guess. You know, it's an exact match domain. It's got a lot of backlinks as well. So in Google's eyes, it's quite a popular brand because there's so many people linking to it. So I think from Google's point of view, it's quite a fair assumption to think people searching for the word razor are searching for the brand razor, not just razors to buy. That's sort of us assuming that we know what everybody's searching for. I'm really intrigued now. So what comes below razor, the electric scooter company in Google's results page? So you get another couple of results that perhaps aren't quite right. So at this point, I can already see that Google's not quite sure on what kind of results to to return. And then the really interesting bit is we see a little bot uh, on the right, sort of in place of the knowledge panel. So this says, see results about, and this breaks down into some different categories. So you get uh, Razor. So it explains what a Razor is. So that's obviously the the kind of search that we want to go for. That's, you know, here's a Razor, buy it. You also get Razor USA, which is a company. You get Razor, and then in brackets, Scooter, which is a scooter company that came up number one. And you get Razor Incorporated, which is a hardware company. So that sort of shows us that Google's not quite sure exactly what you mean because you've only given one word as an example. And actually, out of those 27,000 people that are searching for that term, some people mean the piece of plastic to shave your legs with. Some people mean the school to company. Some people mean the software company. So Google's are just trying to get you to refine that search even further so it can return you exactly the right kind of results. So could you tell us a bit more about that box and when it appears? So Moz actually refers to this as disambiguation boxes, which I really like that explanation of. So it basically just means Google wants to know exactly what type of razor you mean because it can't give people the right search because everybody means something different. You know, there's just not enough information for for Google to go off there. Yeah, it's very interesting because you've given us a list there and not one of those companies involved has any association with razors that are used for shaving. Yeah, definitely. I think now that we're going to get stuck into a little bit more on the keyword ideas, so, you know, refining that headline topic of razor, what can we put into search that sort of refines what we mean a little bit more? So... What I'd say to do whenever you, you know, considering going for a headline term like this, and especially if it's not quite right. So after you've manually looked at the search results, see if there's any brands coming up that sort of match what you're trying to search for. Pop it into the HRF's uh, Keyword Explorer. Once you've popped your keyword in on the overview, you can see a keyword ideas tab. So as part of that, you can also see who ranks number one. So you don't necessarily have to do that uh, manual search, but it's quite interesting to see everything in one place. So what we didn't know from doing that manual check is how much traffic that number one result gets. So that number one result was the Razor scooter company. So we said that the term Razor was searched for an average of 27,000 times per month, uh, according to HRFs. I think that in a lot of SEOs' mind, they sort of think, oh, wow, you know, if I can rank number one, I will get all of those clicks. That's going to send so much traffic to my website. But when we look in that keyword overview tab at that number one result, so the scooter brand, that only gets just over 6,000 clicks out of that 27,000. Wow, that's a huge difference. So less than 25%. Even though 6,000 is quite a lot, it's still pretty low in terms of the click share. That's likely because there's so, so many people searching for the word razor that don't actually mean the scooter brand. They mean something else. So hence why Google's serving up those disambiguation boxes to try and work out who means what. Because some people mean the scooter company, some people mean the piece of plastic used to shave your legs. What's going on further down the page then when you search for the word razor? Yeah, so further down, obviously, we've got the scooter company. Then we get a Wikipedia article on razor, that sort of informational kind of search explaining what it is. Um, But I think realistically, there's not a lot of people searching for what a razor is. You know, we we generally do know this. Then we get the different kind of razor.com, and this is spelled with an E, not an O. So it's interesting to see that Google's matched that with the intent I would imagine that Razor with E, this is the hardware company, that there's a lot of people that search for Razor as in the traditional spelling of Razor, meaning the hardware company end up there. So Google's sort of serving up this, you know, sort of mean, do you mean this instead? Then when we get to sort of position four, we get 
uh, down more the e-commerce side of things. So we've got Amazon, then then Gillette, and then Boots. So it's the really, really big players within the industry, but at least it's starting to get a bit more relevant to what we mean further down the page. But by the time we get further down there, and it's going to be difficult to beat things like Boots, Gillette, Amazon, you know, we're getting quite low then on, on the click-through rates. So I think what we'd need to do next is look at what other keyword ideas we can use. And then, of course, when you throw paid ads into the equation, that you're in a real battle then to be seen. So you're fighting with the scooter company, the hardware company, Amazon, Wikipedia, Gillette, Boots and paid ads. So that's going to take a lot of serious time and investment. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's almost not worth competing unless you've got an exceptionally high budget and a really, really talented SEO team the return that you're going to get on that is going to be quite low. So I think you're better off trying to focus on something a little bit more refined where people know a little bit more about what it is that they're searching for and you can really give them what they're searching for. One thing to remember too is that companies like Gillette and Boots will have hundreds of people in their marketing and web development teams and they'll be continuously working around the clock too. So as you're working hard to try and overtake them, they're also working hard to try and outrank each other and overtake the scooter and the hardware companies. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they've got the power of the the known brand behind them. So, you know, you see them on telly, you see them on social, you know, their marketing is completely cross channel. Whereas, you know, you might be an e-commerce company that pretty much just invests in SEO, maybe a bit of paid ad, you know, you, you don't have that brand presence like, like other companies do. So a lot of people will be pulled into that sort of familiarity, sort of sense of, yep, Gillette, I'm going to go with them. Moving away from high volume searches like Razor, how can e-commerce sites discover search terms that they can realistically rank for then? So I'll sort of talk through two different ideas that you can go down. Let's say, for example, that you're a startup uh, e-commerce, so you don't have sort of your own data within Google Search Console. We'll stick with using a keyword tool like Ahrefs. So at this point, we've already put the word Razor into the keyword of view in Ahrefs. So I do think this is a bit of an overlooked feature because it, you know, it's quite a lot of information all on one page. But if you really dig down into it, you can find some really good uh, extra nuggets there. So this will give you an idea of what sort of topic that keyword falls into. So this bit's really interesting. Um, not necessarily useful, but it's interesting. So for the term razor, the top related keyword, according to Ahrefs, is Razor Ruddock. Yeah, that's really funny. For anyone that doesn't know Razor Ruddock, he's an ex-footballer. And an interesting fact, he was voted the 17th hardest footballer of all time. I'm not quite sure how that ranking came about, but Razor Ruddock is 17. You know, it's brilliant, but it's not quite what we want to rank for. So interestingly there, Razor Ruddock is searched for an average of 32,000 times per month, which is more than just the word Razor. So I wonder how many times he's Googled himself as well. You learn something new every day, I guess. In this section, we can see other keywords that might be more suitable for an e-commerce shop. And obviously, this will depend on what kind of razors you sell. Um, But some good examples here are safety razor, cutthroat razor, electric razor. And then you also get the questions that people ask relating to razors. So then you could use these as part of a content strategy. So when people are searching for questions, so the top one here being how to get rid of razor bumps, they aren't necessarily looking to purchase the razors that you sell right now but they are looking for an answer to a question. So you could be the company to give them the answer. So you sort of stick in their minds when they do need to look at, you know, purchasing a new razor, because if you're knowledgeable on that topic, you might be more inclined to have better razors. Yeah, and you've added value to the user there. So that's going to stick in their mind. And maybe the company sells a razor that reduces the likelihood of bumps or offers some cream or substance that might help people post-shave and they'd be able to promote them in the post as well. Yeah, definitely. And it it is a strategy that we've used throughout the last couple of years. So there's other sort of questions around razor burn, for example, an itchy beard. Um, And it's sort of people with problems and you can sort of give them a solution as well as an answer to a question. So this has really helped to sort of bring in the traffic. Um, Obviously, that traffic isn't going to necessarily convert into a sale directly. So we sort of almost split this down the middle and go, Right, here's what we're focusing on in a transactional sense. So people looking to purchase a specific type of razor. And here's the more informational kind of search that we're going after. So it's not directly going to impact your sales, but it is going to increase your traffic. So we're sort of going twofold on the strategy. That's very helpful that you mentioned breaking the searches down into two different categories. I'm assuming that the informational side is easier to write about too. Yeah, I agree. Um, We sort of have a bit of a knowledge hub on the site so you know depending on 
how people want to structure the site. It might be, you know, your standard kind of blog that fits in with loads of other bits. It might be a specific how-to kind of section. So once people land on the site for any other reason, they can go straight there, look at the guides. So you mentioned that you categorise the searches based on transactional and informational intent. How do you then pick out which ones from each side that you'll be building website pages and blog posts for? We'll generally focus on the sort of intents by the transactional terms first because it's really important that that client gets a return on investment. So we know that they're not going to necessarily get that return on investment through explaining to people you know, how to get rid of razor bumps. So we'll generally start with a keyword map. Here's what you've already got on your website. And here's the keyword research for every category on the website. So then we'll write the, the, the metadata, do the internal linking. Um, and then after that, we'll sort of move on to the more informational kind of terms. So that forms more of the ongoing strategy. So it might be that we want to focus on a specific category because either, you know, they've got a lot of stock, they know that they sell really well, it's got a good markup. Um, and we'll sort of use the informational side to feed into that transactional side. So if we're doing something on safety razors, we might do lots of content pieces on how to use a safety razor, for example, and it sort of links back to your e-commerce category of safety razors. So it's giving that internal relevancy. And now that you have a list of search terms that you want to rank for, how do you make sure that you aren't publishing duplicate content since the things that you can cover when talking about razors is probably limited? So this is where sort of the keyword map comes into play. So this is giving us a really bird's eye view of understanding what every single uh, category or page on the site wants to rank for. Uh, so we're not accidentally ending up with that internal competition where we've got two pages that are very similar or in terms of content or even in terms of what we're trying to target. So what we might do is recommend additional categories. You know, you might not have a category for straight razors, for example, but it might warrant one if you've got enough products and there's enough search in it. What we also might do is try and target sort of two very similar keywords on one page rather than splitting it out. So I believe that cutthroat razor and straight razor are essentially one and the same. So we'd sort of put that together and call them straight razors and uh, cutthroat razors, depending on whichever sort of generates the most impressions or searches. Uh, per month. By doing that, we're not accidentally having sort of two separate pages that are very similar and might compete with each other. Yeah, that's a great point about combining two or more things if the search volumes aren't quite there. At the start of the episode, you mentioned Hrefs to discover new opportunities. I know there are lots of businesses that will probably be using paid tools like that, but are there any free services that are available as an alternative? Yeah, so the absolute best way of doing this is Google Search Console. So if you're already um, an established business, you know, you've got some sort of traction within Google, don't ever overlook your Google Search Console. Um, it's free data that you've got access to. Something that I like to do is I still look at Ahrefs and sort of compare it with what's in Google Search Console. And it's really interesting to see the sort of discrepancies between the tools sometimes because a tool really is just a tool you know it, it's just you know it, it is using data to work out on average how many people search for that per month but it really is just an estimation so if we look at google search console and we look at the impressions so this is real world data so if we look at it over the last three months which i appreciate has been a bit of a strange time and search habits have uh, changed a little bit so if we look at Search Console, and we order it in terms of the highest number of impressions. So the number of times that your site comes up within search results for any specific term. We get Cutthroat Razor first, Safety Razor, Razor Blade, Straight Razor. So these are more the refined searches where people know exactly what type of razor they're looking for. And then quite a bit further down the page, we get uh, Razor. According to Ahrefs, that was searched for an average of 27,000 times per month. But in our actual Google Search Console data, we're getting that as over the last three months, um, less than 2,000 impressions. Compare that with Cutthroat Razor, which is the top impression generating term. That's 25,000 times per month. So if we'd have just stuck with Ahrefs as a tool and sort of ignored all the uh, Google Search Console data, you know, we might have missed out on things like Cutthroat Razor and Safety Razor. And actually, it's really searched for. It generates a lot of clicks. It's far more refined and specific. You know, somebody searching for a safety razor, they know that they want a safety razor, more ready to purchase that than they are just looking for the word razor, you know, and getting things like Wikipedia and scooter companies. Yeah, that's a great answer. I think Search Console has lots of other benefits too, which we don't have time for, but there are some great things that are included in there for free. Another good way to get keyword ideas for free 
you know, literally Google the, the term, so a razor, what else comes up? So in Google's auto suggest, you you know, you get some, here's some extra words to type in that might be a bit more specific to what you're searching for. Or if you do the search for razor, you scroll right down to the bottom, you see searches related to razors. So in this instance, we get men's razors, electric razors, razors and blade, uh, razors for men, women's razors. So these are searches that people have then gone off and performed after doing that search for razor. So then, you know, they've done that search, they've realized, hang on, this is way too generic. I'm not getting what I'm wanting. So it's a good way to sort of go that next sort of step in the funnel. You know, some people want women's, some people want men's. And that already is, you know, divided what people are searching for by 50%. You know, they either want women's or they want men's. I think the moral of the story is that the search terms with the highest volumes aren't always the best converting or the ones that you should focus all of your attention on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it probably is a bit of a vanity kind of metric, probably more for SEOs than, you know, than the client. But, you know, if you can say, oh, I ranked my client for this keyword and it's absolutely massive, isn't that great? Well, that's not really what the client necessarily wants, because if it's an e-commerce site, they probably want a return on investment. They're looking at uh, revenue and profit. They're not specifically wanting an increase in traffic. So in that case, you'd be better off focusing on something a bit more specific. You know, you can bring slightly less traffic to the site, but in doing so, you're getting a much higher ratio of uh, traffic to sales. So the client will ultimately be happier, which is the bottom line. And yeah, that's another great point. We're going to wrap up the main section right here. I'm already pretty sure that I'll be thinking of razors in my sleep for the next few days. But I'm sure that this episode will have helped everyone to understand search intent a bit more and why it's not just as simple as looking at the volumes and going for the top search keywords every time. So to close out the episode, I'll be asking Jen a few fun questions. So please stay tuned. My favourite question that I like to ask my guests is, do you have any fun or memorable stories from when you started out in your marketing career? It's not particularly a fun story or it wasn't fun for me at the time. But my career at Bigfoot's gone quite quickly, quite all over the place. So I started um, as a junior SEO, learning everything that I possibly could learn. Uh, Then I sort of went diagonally um, into account management and sales. And then I sort of missed getting the results for clients. So I wanted to go back over to SEO. And that's when our head of SEO offered me the job as SEO manager. I really felt like I wasn't quite ready. He said, Jen, you're absolutely ready. Like, you'll be brilliant at this. So I did a lot of umming and narrowing over it. You know, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? And I I did do it. And then literally that month, uh, the company brought on the biggest SEO client by a country mile that they'd ever, ever had. And I was just like, how do I deal with this? What do I do? It's so much money. It's, you know, such a big uh, profile client. And I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do this job. So we enlisted so much help sort of across the company and loads of different people chipped in. So that was a really good example of being thrown in at the deep end. Um, You know, I was just thinking I was just going to take over the existing clients that we've got. And then this huge, huge, huge one came in that made so much difference to, you know, our sort of income and staff that we needed you know we needed to expand because of that one uh, client so it's actually been the best campaign to date by quite a lot they, they've got the budget for a really really good campaign there's been loads of different things that we could do it's been really nice to explore that so that campaign sort of grown as i've grown and i imagine that the time that you spent in account management had a positive effect on your work in seo too we're probably short on time in this episode so i'm going to move on to the final question Do you have any SEO or marketing related resources that you'd be able to share with us? So other than the really obvious ones that, you know, everybody reads like Search Engine Land and Moz and things like that, I honestly find the best way to stay on top of things is to follow other SEOs. So on LinkedIn, on Twitter, probably get most of my news from other people. um, And it's interesting to see other people's takes on things as well. So quite often I'll see somebody in the industry mention something, you know, I've just stumbled on this you know, here's what I think about it. And then it gets covered in things like search engine land. So you're getting sort of the same information, just a little bit slower, I think, by reading other blogs and things like that. So definitely look for people that are sort of influencers within that sector. Even not that I'm calling myself an influencer because I really don't think I am. But that uh, LinkedIn SEO assessment, I saw loads of people share that afterwards. And I'd checked LinkedIn, I'd checked Twitter. I couldn't find anything about it before. So it it happens quite often. I think the actual person doing the job spots something, tells everybody about it, and then it gets picked up. So just go straight to the source, follow people that have a good following and give people actual, you know, really good tips, not just, oh, I did this and, you know, aren't I great? Because it's not useful to anybody. Yeah, that was a great tip to close out the episode. 
And if anyone wants to follow that advice, then I'm sure that Jen would be happy for you to send her a connection request on LinkedIn. If you can't find her, then just search for myself too, and I'm sure that I will have tagged her in one of my recent posts. I'm sure that you'll get lots of helpful content from both herself and her network. So yeah, thanks for being a great guest, Jen. Thank you for having me. That was my first ever podcast. So hopefully everybody found that useful. Uh, It'd be great to come on again and chat to you again some other time. And I'm sure a lot of people probably wouldn't have known that unless you'd mentioned it. But I am going to hold you to that offer of recording a new episode sometime in the future. I'm sure there are lots of things that we can talk about that you'll be able to teach us. In the meantime, thanks for listening, everyone. And I'll see you soon with more exciting topics coming soon.